uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my church upbringing. I, I grew up in church, but it doesn't mean I liked church. How many of you were like that? Grew up in church, but you did not like church. That was me. I want to tell you a little bit about my spiritual history because I think it helps for you to know the person that's talking to you a little bit about them. So I grew up in a traditional style church. Anyone here grew up in a traditional style church? That means like organ, choir, robes. Uh, the, the, the pastor would all, when he was done preaching at the end of the sermon, he would recess down the middle aisle and stand at the door and shake your hand. Now, did you have that? Oh, yeah. And uh, what that meant for me as a child is I did not like church at all. So I didn't understand the stand up, sit down, the hymnals. And so really what church was for me growing up was to find those little pencils. Every traditional church has those little tiny pencils. They're like the half pencil, you know. I think they only sell them to churches. And they put them in the pews and then you find any kind of paper to draw pictures or to write notes or you draw in the hymnal and then your parents tell you don't do that. And then you write notes and you send them to other kids around. You pass the notes, try to get them to laugh so their parents will yell at them. It's like a whole system, you know. And this was my church experience. I went to church, but I didn't like to go to church. I'd pretend to be sick all the time. Oh, I just feel bad, you know, on Sunday morning. And then all of a sudden at 12 noon, I felt great, you know. Unbelievable how that happens. It's a miracle. Uh, but as I got older in that church, I realized that my church experience was actually very interesting. It was very, very different as I came to understand the nature and the dynamics at play in the church that I attended. So one of the things I found out was that a lot of people that attended the church didn't believe like a majority of the Bible. So most people went to church for one of two reasons. One, because they felt like a religious guilt that they were supposed to go to church. Like their parents went to church and their parents went to church and so they're supposed to go to church. And then the other people went to church because it was an opportunity for networking. It's like a, a social environment. You could, you know, do some business. You could figure out who you're going to go play golf with on the weekend or whose house you're going to. It was like a social networking environment. And this was interesting because... As I got older, I realized that the message that the church was conveying kind of fit with that. So God in the church that I grew up in was very much like a dream weaver, meaning you kind of have your dreams, and as long as you're like trying to be a good person, you put good energy out there, and you're positive, God's going to weave together your dreams. You know, that's like he's working for your good. And there was also kind of like a, a karma God, you know, like do good, get good, this kind of mentality, there's inspiring, encouraging, like just do good, you know, you're going to get good, God's going to weave your dreams together. And then before my family actually transitioned out of the church, my senior year of high school, that's when I realized that a majority of the people in the church did not believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Like the resurrection was not historical, it was not bodily, it was like a story about what God would do, it was like an inspiring message that you're to take some things from give you hope in life. And that was quite shocking because the church that I went to after was very different message and very different dynamics. And so for me, Easter was really about like the Easter bunny and hunting for Easter eggs and everybody wearing like pastel colors and everybody happy. You know, that's one of the things I like about Easter. Like everyone feels like you got to be happy kind of, you know, it's like Easter happiness. And some of you are probably faking the smile now because you had a rough week. But you're like, it's Easter, like resurrection, we're here. It's awesome. <laughs> now, some of you maybe had an experience like me. You know, if you would have asked me as a child, did I believe in the resurrection, I would have said yes. I would have said, yeah, Jesus, you know, lived the perfect life. He died for my sins and he rose from the dead. But that's because I was socially conditioned to say that. Like, I didn't really believe it. If you really pressed me on it, I just would say it because I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to say that. I'm supposed to believe it. it. had no effect on my life whatsoever. And many of you maybe had a similar experience. Some of you maybe had a more healthy church experience than I did. Some of you maybe had very little church experience. Like you went to church on Easter and maybe on Christmas. And so Easter for you was like maybe you went to church. You did the Easter bunny thing as a kid. You hunted for the eggs. You had a party at your house, possibly. Maybe some of you, you had like no experience with Easter and this is your first church service ever. So many of us come into this evening with a lot of baggage, a lot of experiences, some positive, some negative, a lot of confusion that kind of gets created in our life over time through different experiences and words people have said and things we've heard and doubts that we have. 
certain biases that have been formed. And I understand that. We all have that. But what I want to ask you to do tonight is to ask God, a simple prayer right now. Say, God, can I leave my baggage aside for the next 30 minutes? I want to dive into the story with fresh eyes, with fresh ears, with an open heart. Because we all interact with the story of Jesus' resurrection from different perspectives, oftentimes depending upon our upbringing. And what I want to ask everyone to do, whether you had a rough experience in the church or whether it was positive or whether it was very little, to say, let me experience this story fresh tonight. Maybe fresh for the first time in a long time, Easter 2022. Because this story is not only beautiful, but it is powerful And it brings healing when you see the truth of what is being communicated. So you're on page with me? You're on board? Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 There we go. So tonight we're going to be in Mark chapter 16. This is the very end of the book of Mark. If you've been here at Crossbridge, you know that we've been going through this book in the New Testament for the entire years. We're ending the series tonight. And we're ending where Mark ends in Mark, Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 1. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible with you, no worries. We have the passages on the screen. And always, if you have our Crossbridge Brickle app, which you can download on any app store, there's a note section which has not only the passages, but extra notes as well, uh, just to be a help to you. So here's what God's word says to us. Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him, that's Jesus, and very early on the first day of the week, Sunday, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Okay, let's stop there. So we're introduced to these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And it says that they go buy spices. Now these spices would have been expensive spices like myrrh and frankincense and aloe. There was, there's a, a a kind of a, a list of spices that you would use to anoint a body after someone had, had, de- had died and then they wrapped the body. Now, this was not to preserve the body. This was actually just to show honor and love to someone that died that you care for. So they bought spices and they go early Sunday morning heading towards the tomb because they want to honor Jesus' body. They want to show love and affection to Jesus who has now been dead for three days. Now, this is also a little bit peculiar because normally you would anoint the body with these spices before they closed the stone on the tomb. But this was not possible because when Jesus died, which was at 3 p.m. on Friday, when Jesus died, the hours were only a few hours before the sunset, which means Sabbath started. So you could not be wrapping a body and transporting a body from the hill where Jesus was crucified over to the tomb and rolling the stone. You couldn't do any of that once the sunset and Sabbath began. So there was a rush to take Jesus' body off the cross, to wrap Jesus' body, and to move Jesus' body in the tomb and close the stone. So now Sabbath is past, as it says in verse 1. And these three women want to go to the tomb to do what they didn't have time to do on Friday to show honor and love to Jesus and to anoint his body wrapped in those linen cloths with spices. So verse three, we continue in the story. It says, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? So as they're walking to this tomb that was in a garden, we're told it's in a garden, they're walking there and they're talking to each other like, hey, who's gonna help us move the stone?" Now, this is also a practical question because these stones that they would place in front of tombs were somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds, depending on how big the tomb was and how big the opening was. And the way that they would fashion these stones is they would put them on the side of the tomb, then they would cut this divot so that you'd roll this 4,000-pound stone into this divot. So in order to open the tomb... You would need a lot of people to push this stone up over the incline so that you could get into the tomb. So they know they are not capable of opening this tomb by themselves. So they're saying, hey, who's going to help us? Like, we need to look out, see who's going to help us. Now, there's also more here than just like a practical question that Mark tells us that are thinking like, hey, who's going to help us open the tomb? 
Mark is actually placing this question that they put out there, who's going to help us open the tomb, he's putting it against the statement that the disciples had said earlier. Here's what the disciples asked themselves. They said, who will find out that we are numbered among his followers? Interesting. The women on Sunday morning, they are not concerned about who associates them with Jesus at all. In fact, they're looking for people to co-opt in to their mission to move the stone so they can anoint Jesus' body and show him honor. They are fearless. While the disciples are full of fear. In fact, we know right now from the text that they're actually in hiding. They're cowering in fear, and their question is, like, hey, who's going to find out that we're, like, associated with Jesus? And what kind of consequences may fall upon us if people know where we are and that we're his disciples? See, it's placing the fearlessness of these women against the fear of the disciples in this moment. So they're marching towards the tomb, fearless, looking for people that will help them. In verse 4, it says, And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. So this is probably on the 4,000-pound stone, and it was rolled away. And you have to ask yourself, what are they thinking? Like, they are not going to the tomb assuming that Jesus has risen from the dead. They're going to anoint his dead body wrapped in linen cloths. Now the stone is moved, and they are thinking to themselves, what's happened? Did the disciples all of a sudden get courage and get here a little bit before us? Are they in there? Are they doing this this ritual and this process of showing honor to Jesus with the spices? Did someone move the stone and steal the body to dishonor and discredit? You see, that's actually something that many people during this time accuse the disciples of. When the disciples and these women and others say that Jesus has rose from the dead, do you know what the chief priests and the leaders and others in the city say? No, 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 there's no way Jesus could have risen from the dead. The disciples must have stolen the body. In fact, the disciples say that a lot of people think that. Maybe they're thinking someone stole the body. So they move closer Verse 5 and 6, it says, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So they walk into the tomb. And they see this young man. Now, we know actually in the Greek what they're describing here is an angel. A young angelic figure in white on the right side of the tomb. And it says when they see this man, Jesus' body is not there. This angelic figure, they are alarmed. You're like, yeah, I would be alarmed too. Like an angel in the tomb. That's like probably the last thing they thought they're going to see. And then the angel says, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here. He is risen. See the place where he laid. The grave clothes, the linen cloth are there, and Jesus is gone. Now, there's a lot here. The first thing that we know is that Mark is retelling the testimony of these women, right? The women... Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, they enter into the tomb, and they have this encounter with the angel. They're the ones that hear the words from the angel. Nobody else is there, which means they have told Mark about this encounter, about this experience, and Mark is sharing this information with us in his gospel. Now, you may say, of course, that's, that's, I understand that. Why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. Because this would have been shocking. The very first eyewitnesses, in fact, the chief eyewitnesses in all four Gospels to see Jesus resurrected and to encounter the risen Savior and to see the empty tomb are women. And women in this culture were discredited. In fact, their testimony was so devalued that they wouldn't even use women in the court because they didn't trust what women would say. They would trust a criminal ahead of a woman in this society. 
So Mark is telling us and everyone else that reads that the very first people to have an eyewitness account of the risen Savior, as we read in John, the very first person to encounter Jesus is a woman, Mary Magdalene. She stays in the garden, the other women leave, and she meets Jesus there in the garden tomb. Very first person to encounter the risen Savior, the very first and chief eyewitnesses of the risen Savior and the empty tomb are women, and this is shocking. In fact, around 80 years after Jesus' death, there's this Greek pagan philosopher named Celsus, and he writes extensively about how you cannot believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that he begins to discredit this movement of Christianity that has taken off and is sweeping the Roman Empire. And you know why he says you cannot believe in the resurrection? He says because the main eyewitnesses are women. But Mark writes it down. Isn't that interesting? You maybe have thought to yourself, you know, I have a hard time believing that Jesus rose from the dead. I, w- I hope that your issue is not that the first eyewitnesses are women, okay? <laughs> but you probably have a bias. In that culture, there was a bias against women. You probably have a bias against this story, too. Like, come on, did they really? It doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman, but they, they went into the tomb, they saw an angel. And he's like, Jesus, you're looking for Jesus, he's not here, he rose from the dead. Come on really believe that, like bodily, historically, Jesus rose from the dead? You see, many of us here don't have the same biases that people had in the first century, but we have biases. Many of us, our bias is a supernatural bias. We have a hard time believing in anything supernatural. Now, we all have biases, right? Whenever we can't explain something, we don't understand something, what we do is we create in our mind, some type of understanding that helps us make sense of it or deal with it or push it to the side. And it's often formed out of different biases that we have. As I mentioned, maybe your thought is the same kind of thought that many had in that first century, which is, I don't know if I could believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, maybe these women had some type of crazy encounter. But I believe probably what happened is the disciples stole the body. I mean, that makes the most sense because they want to keep the movement alive. They gave three years of their life. They left their jobs. They left their families. They followed Jesus around, and now he's dead, and it feels like it's over. And so ultimately, at some point, they got courage, maybe early Sunday morning, and they all went out there, all 12 of them. Well, now 11 of them because Judas has betrayed him, and he has actually taken his own life. But the 11 of them go out. They open the stone. They take Jesus' body. They get rid of it, and then they begin to tell people that Jesus rose from the dead. Then they write the New Testament, and they start this whole movement that is Christian. And we're here today. Now listen, I understand that thought, that argument. I understand why if you have a supernatural bias and the resurrection is difficult to grapple with, why what makes sense that the disciples stole the body. But here's the question you have to wrestle with. If the entire New Testament is fabricated on a lie, maybe Much of what Jesus did is true, but it's really fabricated on a lie because the resurrection is the key to Christianity. Without the resurrection, there's no Christianity. And so everything that comes from the resurrection after is all made up by the disciples to create this movement and to have influence and to have power and to start their own religious movement. Then why would they put women in the place of prominence? Think about that. If you're starting a movement and you know it's built upon a lie because you steal the body of Jesus, why would you make the least credible people in society the chief eyewitnesses? Because you would have people like Celsus and many other people that would say, I can't believe anything you said because you placed women in a place of prominence here. Why would you do that? Unless you did, in fact, experience the risen Savior. You see, Mark here, Mark is just writing down faithfully what he heard Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome share. And he, in fact, not only just writes it down, but he gives us their names. He doesn't just say three women. He gives us their names. Why does that matter? Well, because he wants you to be able to verify with them that that's what they said and that's what they saw. 
You see, the New Testament and the Gospel of Mark that we're reading from was not written 400 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. It was written between 35 and 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Almost all scholarship agrees with that fact. Meaning, most likely, you could go talk to Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, and say, did you really say that? Was that what you really experienced? And if they had passed, you could certainly ask their friends and their family. He wants you to verify He goes down to the very detail of where the angel is standing. Like he's standing on the right side. He gives you the details. Because the New Testament, God's word, is not legend. It's history. You see, when you're creating a a legend, like if they stole the body and they erect this legend, what you do is you create a central message and then you fabricate these facts to kind of build a story around the message. But if you're telling history, you just tell the facts as they are. Yes, women were were not credible sources in this society. Mark doesn't care because they were there. They're the ones that had the experience, so he writes their names. He writes their account because he's telling history. You tell the truth. You tell the facts, and the message comes out of that. See, that is what we find here. The New Testament is not legend. It is history. He's faithfully describing what they saw and what they heard. And so when they go in there and they see this angelic figure, he says that he is risen. He is not here. He is not here. You see, the resurrection of Christ is not about the empty tomb. The empty tomb is about the resurrection, It points to the resurrection. That's important for you to understand. Sometimes we talk a lot about the empty tomb because Jesus wasn't there. Yes, as the angel says, he's not there. And why do I tell you that? Because your faith as a Christian, if you're here and you believe in Jesus, your faith is not in an empty tomb. That tomb could have been empty for a whole lot of reasons. Disciples could have stolen the body. Your faith is not in an empty tomb. Your faith is in those who saw Jesus risen from the dead. Those women, the disciples, as we read about over 500 people that he appeared to over 40 days who ate with him and talked with him and put their fingers in the holes in his hands and the cut in his side from the spear, that he was raised historically and bodily. You see, your faith is in those who saw Jesus. Now, maybe your supernatural bias is kicking in again. You're like, did they see Jesus? I mean, I know that it's a lot to believe that 500 people had like a a psychedelic episode and they all saw like a spiritual Jesus, but did he really rise? They really see him. Well, all of New Testament scholarship, including probably the leading New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman, who's an atheist, all of them say that the disciples and the authors of the New Testament really believed they saw Jesus resurrected bodily and historically. It wasn't some kind of like illusion. They really believed it. You see, I tell you all of this not because I believe that through, you know, clever arguments and slick speech that your supernatural bias can be undone. That's not why. I believe that there are very clear and compelling and logical and reasonable answers and reasons for the resurrection. There's so many more than just some of the ones I laid out tonight. The reason I'm telling you all of this is because I want you to see what the church of Christ believes, what Christians believe. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time tonight. I want you to hear afresh and anew what you believe. I want to share with you the Jesus that we read about, the faith that we claim, the experiences that I've had. And that God's people have had with the risen Savior. You see, when we share the resurrection, when we look faithfully into the text, when we deal with our doubts, when we come before the Lord, even with our biases, and allow God to work, what we will find is that he will confirm truth and resurrect a down heart, a despairing heart, a hardened heart. To see the truth of this text, that it is history, not legend at all. Not legend at all. You know, you may discredit some of the things that I've been saying. You may discredit the resurrection, just like many discredited these women who shared their testimony. 
But what I want to say to you tonight, and this is for every single person in this room, is that you can see Jesus. You can see him. You're like, where is he? I don't see him. He's not, he's not here in that way, but he is here. You see, Jesus, in John chapter 11, in the Gospel of John, he has an encounter with another woman. Her name is Martha. She is sister to another, a man named Lazarus. Now, Lazarus has died, and Martha and her other sister wanted Jesus to come early so that he could maybe heal her brother before he died. But Jesus shows up late. They're not happy about it. But Jesus is moved with compassion because he sees their grief and their despair over their brother who has died and been placed in a tomb. And Jesus commands everybody around. He says, hey, roll the stone away. Martha looks at Jesus She's friends with Jesus. She believes in Jesus' power, but she has a supernatural bias. She says, Jesus, we can't do that. If you move the stone, do you know how bad the odor is going to be? He's been dead for four days. Why would you open the stone? She, She doesn't have a concept yet that Jesus could actually bring Lazarus back from the dead. She has a supernatural bias. Here's what Jesus says to her. He says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you, Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? The author of the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. So I don't know what brought you here tonight. Maybe you come to Crossbridge every week. Maybe you're checking this church out for the first time. Maybe you're just checking Christianity out for the first time. Maybe it's been a long time, but something in your spirit said, I need to go to church on Easter. But I think all of us come here for the same reason that's beneath everything. If we peel every layer back and we remove all the baggage, and that is that we want to see the glory of God. We want to see, if, there's God, if God is, exists and he's real and the resurrection is true and Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior, I want to see the glory of God. How do I see the glory of God? How do I see the glory of God? Through belief in Jesus. Because Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. You see, You may not be able to see Jesus physically right now in 2022. You will one day see him physically when we meet our our maker and our creator and our savior. But you can see him tonight through eyes of faith. You can see him. You see, Jesus is our savior who crucified on that cross on Good Friday as we celebrated as a church our sin and our shame and our guilt and our doubts and our biases and our baggage. You could add anything you want there. He crucified it. And when you come to him, when you come to him open and ready to see and ready to receive, what do you find is resurrection? Resurrection of a despairing heart, a broken heart, a dead heart, a hardened heart. Resurrection of biases that have held you back from really encountering the very God that we're here to worship and to see. A resurrection of eyes that actually can behold the glory of God in ways that you never imagined. It's through belief. Every Easter Sunday, as I said earlier in our service, pastors all across this, all across this world say, He is risen and the church responds, He is risen indeed. Amen. See, we always say he is risen, but the text, and our text here in Mark chapter 16 gets it right. The text is not actually he is risen. It's that he has been raised. He has been raised. Now, if he has been raised, then he is risen. Okay, so you're like, what does it matter? These are like semantics here. The reason I'm telling you that is because Jesus himself went to the cross for your sin. Jesus went to the cross for your guilt and your shame and your baggage, and he paid for it with his body, and and it was his obedience to the Father that brought him there. But Jesus did not bring himself back from the dead. He has been raised by who? The third person of the Holy Spirit. The third person of God, the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. In fact, the Apostle Paul says something astounding. He says, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in you. How? Through eyes of faith. Through belief. It's living in you. You see, we all come on Easter Sunday and every Sunday with confusion, with church trauma, maybe with indifference like I had. I had all those things. Confusion, church trauma, indifference. And what led me to faith in Christ when I was in college was not a seminar. It was not a study through all of my doubts. So I, got, I figured everything out and then I was ready to give my life to Jesus. It wasn't a sermon. What led me to faith in Christ was surrender. I was walking one day between classes and I, it just like dawned on me. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to sort through everything. That healing comes through surrender. I surrendered my life to Christ. I still had biases I needed to work through. I had doubts I needed to wrestle through. I still had questions. I still had a lot of baggage. But I wanted to see the glory of God. I believe that Jesus was the radiance of the glory of God and I Gave my life to Christ. I surrendered it through faith. See, I can tell you one thing, because the only thing I can really do tonight is share. Share with you about Jesus. Share with you about my experience with Jesus and the truth of what I know. And that is, every time you surrender to God, you find healing. When you surrender to God, you find spiritual healing, mental healing, emotional healing, healing of broken relationships, healing of perspectives, healing of past trauma and baggage, healing of biases. When you surrender to God, you find healing. Listen, here's what we celebrate tonight. He is not in the tomb. He has been raised. And he is here. He is here with us, church. In fact, he promised us that when we are gathered, he is in our midst. And you can can experience the tangible presence of God because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you through eyes of faith. And what I want to ask you tonight is will you look for Jesus? A fresh and a new, maybe it's been a dry season of your faith. Will you look tonight again with fresh eyes to see Jesus and behold the radiance of God's glory in Christ and what he's done for you? Or will you tonight for the first time look to Jesus and see the glory of God and the forgiveness of God, the resurrection of Christ which can resurrect you because when you look to Jesus, what invades your heart and your mind and your soul and your life is the same spirit that brought Christ from that grave. It's now living in you. Will you pray with me?